We're going to finish up Acts chapter 9. I think we left off at verse 35. So we'll pick up at verse 36 and read to the end of the chapter. <clears throat> so Acts chapter 9, verse 36. Now, there was at Joppa a certain disciple named Tabitha, which by interpretation is called Dorcas. This woman was full of good works and alms deeds, which she did. And it came to pass in those days that she was sick and died, whom, when they had washed, they laid her in an upper chamber. And for as much as Lydda was nigh to Joppa, and the disciples had heard that Peter was there, they sent unto him two men, desiring him that he would not delay to come to them. Then Peter arose and went with them. When he was come, they brought him into the upper chamber, and all the widows stood by him weeping and showing the coats and garments which Dorcas made while she was with them. But Peter put them all forth and kneeled down and prayed, and turning him to the body said, Tabitha, arise. And she opened her eyes, and when she saw Peter, she sat up. And he gave her his hand and lifted her up, and when he had called the saints and widows, presented her alive. And it was known throughout all Joppa, and many believed in the Lord. And it came to pass that he tarried many days in Joppa with one Simon a tanner. And God bless the reading of his word. I think we had an amen over there. Amen. I think last week we finished up talking about Peter meeting Aeneas, which was a man that was sick of the palsy for eight years. And Peter, just like he had seen Jesus do, uh, and that's what he was being trained to do. The whole time the disciples were with Jesus, he was teaching them and training them. Many times he, he would teach them with lessons, parables, whatever, but at the same time, even when it wasn't Jesus standing on the Sermon of the Mount and teaching, even just the time that they were just by themselves or him just going along and meeting people and, and touching them, healing them, or speaking to them, caring for them, loving them, the whole time they were with Jesus, Jesus was teaching them through his life not just the times that he sat down and opened up the scriptures like we're doing here, but the time that they were fellowshipping. And so we remember that in the Gospels that uh, Jesus went up to the man that was at the um, Solomon's Colonnade, I believe it was called, where the man, where the water was stirred about by the angels every once in a blue moon. And they say that whoever got into the water first, if they had some type of sickness or disease, if they jumped into water first, they would be healed. And there was that paralytic man who was there. Uh, from what I remember, I think he had been paralyzed his whole life, maybe 38 years. And uh, Jesus walked to, up to him and said, uh, would you like to be made whole? And the man said, I, sure I would. But whenever the waters get stirred up, I'm paralyzed. I, you know, I can't get my, my friends or the people who brought me here, my family, to, to get here quick enough to put me into the water before somebody else dives in. Uh, maybe somebody jumps in in a cannonball uh, just to get healed. And he said, so I, I'm, I'm pretty much, even though I'm right here by the pool on the edge, I, I, can't, I can't be healed. And Jesus said, uh, basically, if if you just take up your bed right now and get up, you'll be healed. And I remember reading a uh, sermon by G. Campbell Morgan, who, um, I'm trying to think of the name of the church, but All Saints Church, I think, in England, possibly. But it, it was the same church that uh, Martin Lloyd Jones had pastored. As a matter of fact, G. Campbell Morgan. I think handpicked 
Martin Lloyd Jones to take his place. Uh, but G. Campbell Morgan was known as a great Bible expositor, and if I'm not mistaken, he wasn't college educated. I don't know if you ever heard of A.W. Tozer. If you go to any Christian bookstore, there's always something that he has written in there. He wrote many different books. The Pursuit of God is one of his most popular, but he even has devotionals. As a matter of fact, when I first got saved, I had um, my best friend I was telling you about that I went to go visit last week. His mother was a, is a strong Christian, and when she found out that I had gotten saved, she bought me a 365-day devotional. All it was was excerpts from his books from A.W. Tozer, and I learned so much. I mean, there was a lot of stuff in there, and I'm like, I don't know exactly what that means, but it sure does sound good uh, that I learned from him. A.W. Tozer, G. Campbell Morgan, both were traditionally not educated men like most pastors and big-name preachers. Most of them go to really big-name Bible colleges and then go from there to the graduate school, which are called cemeteries, I mean seminaries, and they're highly educated. G. Campbell Morgan wasn't. As far as being taught by somebody else, he spent his time focusing on the Word, and he preached on that message about that man at the pool where Jesus said, just arise and be made whole or, or take up your bed and walk. And he was talking about how that when Jesus gives you a Word or gives you a command, what goes along with that command is the power to be able to do what He has said. And then to me, when I first read that, I was like, man, that's, you know, it's almost like when you first read that story, it's almost like you think that it's kind of like some hocus pocus thing that Jesus, but no, it's, it's, it's like not just him working on his own, but both of them working at the same time. He gives the word and the person has to believe it and receive it. And so Peter saw that. And he said, you know what, I'm going to do, I, I, I'm doing my part to believe. And I'm going to heal this person. You know, I'm, I'm sure it doesn't say here, but uh, from the day of Pentecost on, we read of how at different times it says the Holy Spirit led them to do this or led them to do that. I don't know if specifically the Holy Spirit said this man needs to be healed. You know, maybe there was somebody else along the way that said, well, we'll pass this one up, but this one needs to be healed. Oh, or if it is that when the Holy Spirit fills a person's heart with the love of God, they just have compassion on whoever they see. You know, it talks about Jesus going uh, and, and healing all the sick in one town. You know, he'd already spent all day teaching and ministering and healing and then tried to get some rest at night. But in, instead of resting, he spent the whole night in prayer. And the first thing in the morning before they could, the disciples woke up. People were already coming to where Jesus was so that they could be ministered to and receive the word of God and be healed. So I don't know if that was that. I, I think it was just that Peter was so full of the love of God from the Holy Spirit that he said, rise up. And it says he rose immediately. And we remember what happened because of that. As a result of that, it says and many turned to the Lord. But then we come to this part where there was this lady named Tabitha who was also called Dorcas. I don't know if you remember uh, Barnabas. That was his nickname. And I think we talked about that a little bit, that, uh, you know, your name, uh, say, for instance, me. Uh, my name is Donahue, but if people were to try to maybe give me a nickname based off of what they see in me, I might be called Agitator or Mr. Sarcastic or so, I don't know, something like that. Uh, but just like with Barnabas, I forget, I think his name was maybe 
Joseph, I could find it in first or second chapter of Acts, but I don't want to turn to that right now. I want to focus on this. Um, but Tabitha was her given name, but everybody called her Dorcas, and it says here uh, that Dorcas, this woman, was full of good works. And I've got a little thing after the verse that gives the, like there was a little footnote, and I guess Dorcas means works of mercy, possibly. But anyway, she got sick and died. So Peter wasn't around when she was sick. But when she did pass away, they cleaned her up, preparing her body for burial. But they laid her up in the upper chamber. And I don't know if I, maybe that was a tradition. I, I do remember hearing like back before Oh, maybe in the early 1900s, but back even further than that, supposedly when uh, people passed away, the funeral director or the uh, uh, the funeral home or whoever would prepare the body, but then they would take the body to the home. Mm -hmm. It was that way whenever I was a child. Yeah, because I remember a lady I used to go to church with said that uh, that's the way they did her, I think her dad. Yeah, they put a glass top on the coffin. Yeah. No, wait a minute. I'll, I'll take that back. Uh, I was at, I was there when, uh, after her dad passed, and we went to her parents' home or where her dad lived. <clears throat> and I'm thinking that it was before the funeral home got a hold to him. And so we went to, to visit because we knew he was sick and he was soon to pass. So anyway, we got the word. So my pastor and I uh, went over to the house to visit with him. And when we walked in the door, you know, there was family and the lady from our church that was uh, the daughter of the man that passed. And we were all standing there and, and you know, some of them were talking or whatever. And then uh, I just happened to look over to my left. And I think it was, I think it was a bed there. And her father was still there in the bed and I kind of it kind of shook me a little bit because I I don't think I'd ever been around other than maybe at a funeral home or in a church service a funeral service where the person was but not before somebody else got a touch uh, got a hold of them anyway but I think that was tradition as Jerry said he had been in uh, and probably many of you have too but that, that may have been what this was, that this was a time where people who loved and knew this person could come by and see them one last time before they were planted as a seed in the ground, as 1 Corinthians uh, 15 says. So they were planted in the likeness of a seed in hopes of the resurrection when they would be coming out uh, with a glorious body. I, I went to a funeral service um, yesterday and uh, the pastor was talking about going through some of the passages in the Bible of the promise of a new body and he was talking about that one particular passage in 1 Corinthians 15 but um, I, I want us to look at and notice this that uh, it says that they sent a couple men when they found out that Peter the apostle was in a town close by they, they sent two men and said Go find Peter and bring him here. And it doesn't say that, that they, <clears throat> all it says is that they sent unto him two men desiring him that he would not delay to come to them. Why? I mean, it doesn't say it, but we find out later what they actually wanted. Uh, they wanted him to bring her back from the dead. Because he had been around Jesus. He had seen it done many times before. And they knew all this. So then Peter arose and he went with them. And when he was come, they brought him into the upper chamber. And all the widows stood by him weeping and showing the coats and garments which Dorcas made while she was with them. Ain't that something to, to, to be so full of Jesus that it shows through your life to where you're, you're doing good works, not because you think that doing those good works is going to 
merit your salvation. It's going to get you a, a, a free ticket to heaven. That's already been taken care of. That's been paid for. Jesus said on the cross, it is finished. In other words, the debt has been paid. All we have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And because of the sin, uh, the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ. Paul said it in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9, that we are saved by grace through faith, that not of ourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. None of us can go around and say, because of this, I'm going to heaven. Because of what I have done. Because of who my parents were, who my grandparents were. It's none of that. The only reason that any person can get to heaven is because of what Jesus Christ has done and their faith and their trust in Him for what He has done. So these people were showing all these things that, that Dorcas or Tabitha had made. And what I was saying was that it's a wonderful thing that a person so be filled with Jesus, with the Holy Spirit, that they live such a life that people see it and when that person gets sick and dies, that they, they just, it just breaks their heart. To the point to where, if it was possible, if Peter were here today, I wonder how many of us, if we were to pass, people would go find Peter to say, please bring him back. We miss him so much. We don't want them... We don't want the world to be without this person. Uh, the, at the funeral service, uh, one of the sons of the man who passed away, it was a friend of, uh, that I knew, one of the things he said was about his father was that I believe that the world is a better place because of the lives he touched. Uh, how many people can say that about us? And I'm not just talking to the people here that I believe everybody in here somebody would say that but I'm talking about people who may be watching uh, on YouTube or Facebook or whatever uh, have you lived in such a way that that Jesus had has consumed your heart and your mind and your life that if you were to pass that people would really want you back now the, the man who passed away yesterday or that we had the funeral service yesterday he was so sick in his body that as much as it hurt the family, they would not desire to want him back. They know that he's better off. Uh, he's in heaven with the Lord. Uh, one of the things that the, the, the preacher said yesterday was, and everybody knew this about the man, he, he, uh, he had addiction. Uh, he, he constantly, he, he drank all the time. But all the years that I've known him, no matter how much he drank, he was always one of the sweetest, kindest, humblest men I have ever met. Every time I'd see him, he'd say, Hey, Donahue, how are you doing? So I'm doing fine, how about you? And call him by his name, and he'd say, Oh, I'm doing all right. And you know, he might be, had just gotten out of the hospital a week prior. Uh, one of the other things his son said was that uh, uh, they called him Houdini because of all the many times that he's escaped death. That I mean, he was knocking on death's door, but so many times through the years that he's come out and was able to go. But this last time, he didn't make it. But it was a good thing that he didn't make it because now he's with the Lord. But this lady here, Tabitha or Dorcas, they... They were so tore up that she passed away. They, they showed the things that she had done in her life. Uh, it's just a testament to the Spirit of God working in her and through her. But Peter, again, we read of what he did. They were there, the widows, standing all around, showing all these good works and weeping. And what did he do? He did the same thing he saw Jesus did that we see in the Gospels. He put them all forth. In other words, he cleared the room, everybody out. Right now, this is just between me and the Lord. 
He kneeled down and he prayed and turned him to the body. So in other words, he kneeled down, he prayed, and after he said his prayer, I, I wish we could see what he prayed. I mean, you, you read different things like this in the Bible where it doesn't give you all the information that you would like to have, and you say, I wonder what he prayed. And, and, and I don't want us to, to wonder what he prayed thinking that if I prayed the same thing, maybe the same thing will happen with me. But I would just like to know, was it a short prayer? Was it a long prayer? How long did he pray? Uh, I can't remember who it was I was listening to not long ago, maybe this past week. It's not the quantity of the prayer, but the quality of the prayer. You know, sometimes it may, it may call for like Jacob who wrestled with the angel of the Lord all night long before he could get the blessing. Jesus Many times it says that he would go apart from the disciples and pray all night long. And, but then you read of some people like the prophet Elijah when he was on Mount Carmel battling with the prophets of Baal. And they said, well, let's, let's just settle this God thing here today. Let's make two altars. And we'll have two sacrifices, one for your God or God's and one for my God. And I'll let you go first. And they spent all morning, all afternoon, uh, practically all day doing their rituals, doing whatever it was that, that seemed to please their God to get his attention to light the sacrifice on fire. One of the things Elijah said was, in this contest, whichever God answers by fire, that will be the God that all of Israel will serve. And so they, they were praying, they were probably singing uh, rock and roll songs or heavy metal or whatever. Uh, then finally it got to the point to where they got so uh, desperate they began to cut themselves and shedding their own blood to try to get their God to answer by fire. And then finally, um, after Elijah began to, uh, what was it I said last week? Trash talk him. Smack him. Yeah, talking smack. I had somebody call me up and ask me, now exactly what does talking smack mean? <laughs> so anyway, we had to explain that. And uh, so he... he started talking smack. He said, well, maybe your God has gone to the bathroom or something. Maybe he's asleep. Maybe you need to just shout a little louder. Uh, uh, what is it? You know? And then finally he said, okay, that's enough. Y'all have had all day. Now it's my turn. And it says that the, the, the prayer is recorded and it, it's just a very short prayer. It probably didn't take 10 seconds. And before, My guess is before he can say amen, the fire came down from heaven and lit his sacrifice after it had had so much water poured onto the sacrifice that the trench around the altar was full of water. And God answered by fire and everything got burned up. Uh, so, again, it goes back to it's not so much the quantity, how much you pray, as it is how much of you praise, I guess. The sincerity. The sincerity, the the brokenness, uh, praying, as the Bible says, with your whole heart, with everything that, that it's all of you. That Just like Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane when he prayed and said, Father, if, it, if it's be your will, let this cup pass from me. And it says that he prayed that night so hard that his sweat became a sweat, uh, drops of blood. And that, that's some serious and hard praying. I have, when I was maybe a little bit older than Isaac, I would get so frustrated with my mom or, or with my, both my parents that I would cry so hard and be so mad, be so upset that my nose would begin to bleed. Mm -hmm. I'd be so, ah. of course my face turned 
beet red. And, uh, but I have never, and I don't think anybody else here has, prayed so hard that your sweat becomes as blood. But I think if we did, I think we would see a lot more going on in the church. Not saying that we should strive to, to pray till we bleed, but I know in the book of Hebrews it does say that we should strive in our prayers uh, to, to the point of blood to keep from sinning. You've not resisted unto blood striving against sin. It would be wonderful if the church would do that. I think, I think if we could get to that point, I think there would be a lot going on in the church where more people that we know would begin coming to church and wanting to know more about our Savior. Uh, but in our striving for that, I, I found this out, and I've shared this many times in my own testimony, that the harder that I tried to stop doing things that I shouldn't do, I found out that I didn't have the power to stop. And, but I, I feel like that God led me along that way to show me that no matter how frustrated you may get, no matter how red in the face you may get trying to stop from sinning, if you just give up what you're trying to do and just trust in what Jesus has already done, and let him live his life through you, you can overcome these things. And what a revelation it was to me that it, it was like, to me it was like getting saved all over again. Because for me to get to the point to where I asked Christ to save me, I was trying to work my way into that. I was trying to be good enough for God to save me. And then Somehow or another, the, the, the Holy Spirit opened my eyes to help me to see uh, that one of the things that the Holy Spirit, Jesus said, would do in the book of John was convince the world of sin. And he convinced me that I was such a, uh, just like everybody else. I even had a, a, a friend of mine that I knew from my Navy days. First time I talked to him on the phone, one of the first few times I talked to him on the phone after 17 years of not knowing where he was and not knowing if he was alive. I was trying to share my testimony and I was saying, you know, I, I, God revealed to me how much of us, and he was like, stop, stop, stop. I, you, you're a good person. You're a good guy. You know, he was saying, I, I, I knew you. I was friends with you and you weren't that bad of a person. As a matter of fact, you were better than a lot of other people. And he, it, but when Jesus calls your name, the Holy Spirit reveals to you just how sinful you really are in God's eyes, not in people's eyes. We can be fine and dandy, some of the greatest people in the world in some people's eyes, especially if our family, hopefully. But when the Holy Spirit opens our eyes to help us to see how God looks at us, and then we, we realize that there's nothing that we could do to merit God saving us. Then that's when you get to the point to where you say, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Save me for Jesus' sake. So just like working my way up to that, I had to work my way up after that point of salvation to figure out that there's nothing that I could do apart from God to get me to live a holy life. He has to do it. And he brought me to that point point in about six months after being saved because I had done some god-awful things that I shouldn't have done as a Christian. And when I came to that realization that I, I was thinking to myself, man, am I even really saved? Why would I do such a thing? And I was like, I remember that time that I prayed a simple little prayer. Again, this was not a long prayer, not the quantity prayer, but it was the quality prayer that I was praying sincerely with my whole heart. God, I can't stop this. Will you do something? And he did. And from that time on, after about a week or two, I think I told you that, that one of the things that, that made me really realize what God had done in my life 
was I got up in the middle of the night to go to the bathroom and I had my grandmother's hope chest, I think it was, on the foot, at the foot of the bed. And when I got up and started walking, I stumped my toe on that thing and that thing was solid and it was heavy. And I didn't say what I usually said when I did stuff like that. I just said, ow. I'd say, thank you, Lord. Yeah. Well, right after that. <laughs> well, after I said, ow. Before that, you might have said some choice words. I would have said something like butter, beans, and cornbread, but I didn't say that. <laughs> and, uh, and then it, it dawned on me, there's a change that has taken place. And God did it. certain things like that that does stand out because like before I got saved I, I smoked of course I still did afterwards and I knew I needed to quit but then when I got real sick with bronchitis the doctor told me I need to and so I would quit I'm you know wouldn't smoke anything then I'd be around a friend of mine that, and it, <clears throat> believe it or not it smells so good so I'd light up one you know and I prayed every day, Lord, you got to help me with this. You have got to help me. I know I need to quit, but I can't do it by myself. And then one day I lit a cigarette up, and I have never tasted anything that tastes so bad. Yeah. Uh -huh. And I have never wanted one since. Not even thought about wanting one since. So I know the Lord took that away. Yeah. And He can do it. And this was within a few months after I got we got saved the first year we were married. Yeah. And uh, I, I know he did. And then talking some, some language. That's yeah. Like, <laughs> and I can imagine being so married to him that it was. Six in your mind yeah, like that. You, <laughs> that you know, you know, that the Lord. Because that was one or two little words that I would, you know, it's just a habit. Not anything really, really bad. But yeah. you have to pray about things like that. And you have to let the Lord do it because you can. Yeah. <clears throat> We need to constantly have something worked on in our lives. And, and some, if you're like me, some of the things that the Lord works on in me, he has to do over and over and over and over. Wow. And I had a temper. Yeah, I, I, I was going to say I did too, <laughs> but I still do a little bit. Well, I think we all do. Yeah. But, I mean... Well, I, I do notice, at least I hope I do, that the things that the Lord keeps having to do in my life, they're not as long or as bad, I guess you could say, as they used to be. In other words, I feel like, uh, I was going to say the, sh the fuse is getting shorter, but that that's the opposite of what I mean. The fuse has gotten a lot longer. I've got more patience, uh, long-suffering, uh, the older you get, you, yeah. you'll, the older you get, you'll discover it ain't worth it. Well, not only that, but I mean, because you do see some people that the older they get, the worse they get. Yeah. So it's not so much age that helps you get it, unless you're walking with the Lord. Uh, that, it, and it, it's not a get quick, what you call it. Yeah. It's a process. It's a process Daily, of... Daily, yearly, monthly, yearly. Yeah. It's a process. And we always have to present ourselves before the Lord to ask Him to do that change in us and to keep that work going on. What's that, 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 that old uh, children's song? He's still working on me. They don't uh, sing in those little songs like yeah. this. Like when our kids were little. I, th I think Heather knows that song. If she was here, I'd get her to sing it. I'm in the Lord's army. I'm serious. Yeah. Our son up there singing that. He would, he would put the motions to it. And, but it, it says in that song something about he made the, the stars and the planets and all this stuff. And in other words, he's still working on me. And I hope he's, uh, well, I know he wants to still work on us. We'll let him. We gotta that's, let him. The, that's the key, that we've got to present ourselves to him to let him work on us. Um, let him work on us. He kneeled down, he prayed, he turned to the, the girl just like he'd saw Jesus do. Uh, it's, it's recorded at least once in the Gospels, but like John says in the last chapter of the book of John, it says uh, that there are so many things that Jesus has said and done 
that are not written in this book that even if it were written down, the world can contain the books written about it. In other words, uh, we don't have the whole complete story of what Jesus did three and a half years in his public ministry. But we do have that one story about where he went in and prayed with that little uh, girl that was passed away. And he did the same thing that, that Peter did. So Peter got that from him. And so he said, when he turned to the girl, Tabitha, arise. And she opened her eyes. And she saw Peter and she sat up. I don't know if it was like shock, like, what are you doing in here? Who are you? Or if it was like, I know who you are and I know where I just came from. <clears throat> then it says, and he gave her his hand, lifted her up, and when he called the saints and the widows, he presented her alive. Man, what a... Could you imagine? I, I, you know, I, I don't know. I'm sure that there were as many people as were there, each one had a different reaction. Some of them probably just stopped and stared. Some of them probably started shouting and, and, and praising the Lord. And other people were like, ah, they were scared. Like, this, that's a, that, that person was dead just a few minutes ago. Uh, all the many varied reactions, but man, what, what a reaction it was. It was a whole lot better than just keep on weeping and crying. But you know, even with that happening, she, just like Lazarus, and maybe so many others that Jesus rose back from the dead, they had to die again. But I, I wonder, you know, and it doesn't tell us anything here, I wonder what she saw. Yeah, that's what I was just thinking as well. You know, you, there's books out there about where they, this one was passed away and they going up to heaven, sit on Jesus' lap and, yeah. and all this and everything. And, but here, you, you don't hear any of that. No. Not, not that any of that didn't happen. We no, just don't know. It's just, I, I, think, I think it was, the Holy Spirit was like, that's not important for them to know. There's enough in the Bible to tell you what is to come and what to expect that we don't need to give the details of what happened to Tabitha or Dorcas. But it, uh, I like what it says here after he presented her life. It says in verse 42, And it was known throughout all Joppa, and many believed in the Lord. You know, the, those people that were crying were probably thinking, as they were probably saying to Peter when they were showing all the things that she had uh, made and crafted and weeping, why did she have to die? Why? She was such a good woman. She did so many good things. And, and why? And why? And why? It doesn't say what Peter, if Peter said it, or if he didn't say it, but I'm sure he was thinking it in his head, he was probably repeating in his mind, or else the Holy Spirit was bringing it back to his remembrance, what Jesus said when they came up upon uh, a man that was born blind. Lord, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he should be born blind? And he said, neither one. This man was born blind for the glory of God. And, and, I think we've got all of this story of what happened with this, wo this woman, Tabitha or Dorcas, and Peter coming and praying and, and raising her from the dead just so that we could get to the main thing in that small little verse, verse 42, and many people or many believed in the Lord. That was the focus of what happened there. Anything that anybody does in service for the Lord, that should be the reason why, so that many will believe. You know, I, 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 as much as I look forward to coming to church to either teach in Sunday school or to listen to the pastor preach or listen to the music or experience different programs that are going on at the church or Probably some of the favorite things is my time of fellowship with y'all, both in church and after church. Our main focus or my main focus should be somehow to bring glory to God so that people would believe in Jesus. You know, there's nothing wrong with all those other motives of coming to church so I can see my friends and spend time with them and and hear a message from the pastor, 
you know, through by the Lord through the pastor, or to, to experience teaching and feel God's presence in the classroom. Uh, but my main focus should be to serve the Lord and to help draw people closer to Him. And I hope that we do that not only in church, but also throughout the week. That's what the teaching is for. Isn't it? Yes. Not, not just for the unsaved, but for us to draw closer. Yes. You know, and to help and draw others closer. Sometimes that we don't understand just reading it, which helps us draw closer. You know, I, 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 th I think of different things as I have grown up through life that I used to not have any interest in, could care less about. Uh, well, I'll give you one, and I think I shared this maybe last week, uh, one that I, th I think that I will never have any interest in, and that's NASCAR. But there have been other things in my life that I had, had no interest in, but because of some of my friends having interest in it, I began to have interest in it, and now I, I'm, I enjoy those things. But NASCAR is one of, I don't care if any of you were to tell me that I'm a great NASCAR fan, and you talk about it all you want to to me, I'm not going to be interested, and never will be. I, I, I went to a little dirt race uh, out, out in Alamance County. I can't remember the name of the track out there, but um, it was so loud and so dusty and dirty that uh, I don't want to even see the big <laughs> racetrack with louder cars and more cars. But, um, so that's nothing. But I, I want us I, to have the desire that, that we love and so interested in God and, and Jesus that we talk about it, that people can see it in our faces, in our lives, that it helps people who are not interested in Jesus want to become interested in Him. You know, I, I think we do that even whenever we go out to eat after yes. church because we, we were presenting an example there of praying together and then they know we've come from church. That's what I was getting ready to say. So that's, that's just a real good example as well. Exactly. Uh, you know, and I, I shared this before and I'll stop, uh, but I remember when, before I got saved, I got saved while I was working at Shea Restaurant in Burlington. Used to be behind uh, where Libby Hill is now, near Alamance Regional Medical Center, uh, down Kirkpatrick Road. Used to work there, and that's, that's where I, I met the Lord. A girl that I worked with kept pastoring me to go to church with her, Lisa Thrift, if you're listening. Um, thank you again. Um, but I remember there was a pastor of a local church there who used to come in with at least one or two other couples, and they were regular customers. And they were the type of people that when you saw them coming, please don't. Don't sit in my section. I'm serious. I mean, this man was a pastor, but he was just so mean spirited. That's not a good witness. Bitter. Uh, this this was what some of the things he would do. His church, I think, if I'm not mistaken, his church was on the side of the highway. You could see. As a matter of fact, I'm trying to think of the name of the place there, Home Depot. Where Home Depot is downtown in Burlington, right off the highway, off of 40, his church sits on the hill right behind it, or right beside it. And like during Christmas time, he would uh, do something similar to uh, taking like a Santa Claus and hanging it. And just do crazy weird stuff to show that we don't believe in that. We only believe in the Bible. And but he was that type. I, I didn't wait on him that much, but I could just see him from a distance and see. Legal, legalistic. Le very, very legalistic. Very legalistic. We, we use the pastors like that too. Yeah. And um, so he was the type that he, he, you couldn't, he couldn't draw a fly to honey with his personality. And. Uh, I don't stop talking about that, but anyway. But 
we should be so sweet that we present Christ in such a way when we, if we go out to eat or whatever, like Jerry said, when we go to, out to eat, people know we just got through leaving church. Not everybody dresses up on Sunday and goes to the restaurant, but especially after, that we should not be the type of people that are so mean and so picky with a, I get, you know, I get a little picky because I, if you've ever waited tables before, you know how it works. So I say to anybody that's ever waited tables before, you've got a right to be picky. Well, you can be picky and not do it in an ugly way. Yes, you could be picky and not do it in an ugly way. And uh, I remember also that that pastor was not a, a very big tipper if he tipped at all. So anyway, that's, that's another, and I've shared that before, that uh, yeah. uh, we used to, when we, f we opened up for s on Sundays for a while, and uh, people didn't like having to work on s Sunday. Not because it was Sunday and it was Lord's Day. It was because they knew that church people didn't tip that well. Anyway, we'll, we'll stop with that. <laughs> Father, we thank you so much for your word. We, uh, we didn't get to talk a whole lot about what actually happened. Uh, we, but Lord, I, I feel that what we shared uh, has been helpful. We talked about how that uh, nobody can merit their way to you. Nobody can earn their way to heaven. It's only through Jesus Christ and his death on the cross and his rising from the grave three days later and putting their trust in him, repenting of their sin. In other words, turning away from it and turning completely to, to hope and trust in Christ and what he has done that gets them to heaven. But also not only that, but it's the same way with our being made like Jesus, being made righteous, being made holy, uh, doing good works. It only comes from God in us and through us that brings God glory. And I pray the Lord you would help each and every one of us that we would grow in the grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ and that others would be drawn to that so that we can say, as it said in verse 42, that many, by seeing our lives and what we do for Christ and our service for Him, would believe in you. May they see that change and difference that you have done in our lives and desired it for themselves. I pray that you'd bless our pastors this morning, bless our services, the songs, the music, the ministry there. Lord, I pray that you just bless everyone that comes in today, especially if they're not saved. If they don't know Christ as Lord and Savior, may they see or hear something today that would draw them closer. And I hope today that they would put their trust in you. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Ah, yeah. To everybody that's watching. Oh, yeah. I don't know. I got to put mine on anyway. I don't know how much of y'all can be seen in the camera, but... On three, one, two, three. Merry, Merry Christmas. Christmas. <laughs> we miss y'all. <laughs> God bless.